Welcome to the Teach, Learn, Live podcast. I'm your host, Tim Bullard, Secretary of the Department of Education in Tasmania. Through this podcast, we're going to shed some light on how we're connecting students and young people to succeed. Every day in our classrooms, we've got teachers working hard to inspire our learners. And I see great school leaders making a real difference in many people's lives. Join me as we get to know more great teachers, curious learners and inspiring families and communities who teach, learn and live in Tasmania. Teach, learn, live Tasmania! (laughs) My guest today is John X. Last year, John was one of Tasmania's public school ambassadors, sharing stories and celebrating the value of public education throughout the year. He was born and raised in Tasmania, attending Lindisfarne North Primary School, Gilston Bay High and Rosney College. John has an extensive career in corporate entertainment, stage, radio and television. And he's also one of Australia's most sought after musical performers, most recently playing the Cowardly Lion in The Wizard of Oz. He's previously appeared as Pumbaa in Lion King the Musical, for which he was nominated for a Mo Award in 2016. And he's been in productions such as Opera Australia South Pacific and Billy Elliot the Musical. He's a regular on our TV screens, with television credits including Rosehaven and The Kettering Incident. And you might also recognise his voice from his role as a broadcaster on ABC Local Radio. Uh, So welcome, John, to the Teach, Learn, Live Tasmania podcast. Thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure. So last year you were one of our ambassadors for public education. We celebrated 150 years of public education in Tasmania and we had a ball going around the state. It was great. You shared your stories and your experience during that time. Mm -hmm. What role do you think public education plays in Tasmanians' lives? Oh well, um, uh, based on I mean, based on what I, or my research and what I've and my experience over the years, it plays a massive role in most uh, uh, people's people's lives. I don't know what the figures are in regards to who goes to public education and who does private, but practically all my friends, all the people I grew up with in, in my area, and I grew up on the eastern shore. You know, it sort of it sort of shaped where uh, who I was and what I did. I mean, I started off being very sport minded in primary school. And then by the time I got to high school, I wanted to do things like accounting and technical drawing for some weird reason. And then I hit college and then I discovered drama. And then that shaped what my career was going to be. But, you know, I changed my mind about 15 times. And I suppose that's the beautiful thing about it is that there's so much you can do with your life and when you have to have choices. And it's a lot different now than there was for, you know, 40, 30, 40 years ago when I went to school. I said 40, I could say 40 now. No, no what am I? I just turned 50. So, um, yeah. 35 odd years ago, things have changed now. Like it's not all about maths, science and and English anymore. And I think the choice that you have in regards to what to study and what careers to pursue and the fact that you can change your mind and change from year to year and the people that that are in the public school system who teach these people, who understand these people, who come from the same sort of, I guess, level uh, that these people come and background and, the, and they're willing to help them out. I think it's, it's a vitally important part of shaping people's lives in Tasmania especially. So do you want to describe John the student? Uh, <laughs> you've, you, you've talked about uh, heady days um, in theatre at Rosney College but you also went to Gilston Bay High and I think you went to Lindisfarne North Primary. Correct. Correct. I did get Lindisfarne what, North What would we have seen if we were looking in on John the student? Uh, well he had hair. Uh, which I don't have now. Um, he had hair. Uh, look, he was, um, I was... I was a pretty good student. I was one of these students who was n- naturally quite good at stuff, so didn't try as hard as I probably could have. And I love talking. I love chatting. I love the camaraderie of being in a co-educational uh, public school uh, the whole of my life. Um, so I love that more than anything. The fun. So that's what I look forward to catching up with my mates, playing sport when you, you, know, you had to play sport. It's great. You know, you had to, one day a week, you had to do PE. It was, it was awesome for me. Um, so I loved all that stuff and I loved coming And that's why I got introduced to music in, early in primary school and that sort of helped me on down the track. By the time I got to high school, I started playing tuba. You know, still no drama. So the drama, so I, was, I guess I was a bit sporty in, in primary school and then I maintained the sport all through high school. I played like things like cricket and football and basketball, I think, and then I got 
right into basketball and stuff as well, but at the same time still pursuing uh, academic subjects, but got all sort of maths and science and accounting and technical drawing-y sort of stuff in high school and then try to pursue that in college. But then, so you found this kid who was um, from a Greek background, which was hard, um, and I won't, you know, I won't colour the picture. I, it was tough in, in, in high school especially. That's where I realised that some people didn't like the fact that you were Greek and I was sort of introduced to the word wog a lot. But I sort of, you know, I was pretty resilient and I was, you know, dealt with all that. And I went to a pretty sort of tough school, Gilston Bay on the Eastern Shore, right near um, you know, Rizmo, Gilston Bay and Rose Bay were the sort of, and you had Warrain High School as well. There's a quite quite a few tough schools on the Eastern Shore in the public in the public system. But um, yeah, so I was uh, quite a resilient, happy-go-lucky, um, chatty sort of guy, and got on really well. And did like languages, discovered languages in in high school as well uh, at Gilston Bay High, and did French and German, and did quite well because I was Greek, because I could do all those throw de I could do all those sounds that the Germans and the French use, because a lot of them are in the, the Greek language as well. So. So that sort of helped me, and I and I cashed in on that as much as I could, and loved school. But you know, always was was always the sort of the fat kid who could run and play sport pretty well for a fat kid. A multilingual, overweight, sporty student. That's right. Yeah, from a Greek background, yeah. and just a nice guy. I mean, I've always been very nice, and that's my parents. Some of used to say that was always my downfall because I've always been very generous with everything, and I've always been happy to help, and I never say no to things. So that was always a a problem. And I like you know, I used to hate cross country running. And the problem with going to a place like Gilston Bay High School was we had to run across the Ovals over to the hill on the other side up over, and through Shag Bay. And you'd go down to this bay and then you'd go up this steep hill, which almost was like a you'd be climbing a cliff and then down the other end of it. Like, it used to kill me. Like I'd, I'd come back from cross-country running with a couple of my mates at the back of the group half an hour into lunchtime. You know, lunch had started, half an hour in, we're training. Packed up the tables. That was full on. But Everybody I did it. Gone I home. didn't say no and, you know, didn't cry and I, I got stuck in it. So, you know, John X, the schoolboy, was pretty much into everything. I like, I tried everything. Everything was on offer and I, and I did choir and stuff and then it was interesting that I did that early in primary school. Didn't do much of that in high school and then all, it all came back in college and I started singing and and acting all over again, so I did the full circle, but had a hell of a time amongst it all. And then, yeah, and, it's, and then I'm therefore am multi skilled. I know all about a lot of sports, and I don't know I know a little bit about technical drawing, and I know a lot about maths and science, and I know a heap about drama because that ended up being my career. And you know, and going back, and and I spent a lot of time in the nineties going back to to Rossney College, for example, and chatting to kids about drama and how I got my start, and how you know Rossney College was the best. To, I went back for a third year and just did drama because I loved it so much. Um, best three years of my life. So I've already heard um, a couple of the values that, that I think you, you saw or you got instilled in you from public education. I've heard that you had to be resilient. I heard that you had to pursue opportunities that were provided to you. Mm-hmm. Um, and you certainly um, did that. And also, too, that, you know, keeping your options open and, and exploring different pathways mm-hmm. seems to be something that, that was part of your, your education. What other values do you think public education brought forward for you? I think uh, one of the most important things, I guess, when I think back about it now is that the fact that I was in a public school opened me up to people from all sorts of different backgrounds, ethnicities and um, socioeconomic backgrounds as well. And no matter how tough it was, at my toughest time of being you know, a, a fat Greek kid, at, you know, a, mainly, a mainly sort of... Caucasian, sort of anglo saxon sort of schools, there's always someone else worse off than you. And, I, and there were people with all sorts of different problems and issues and stuff. And then I remember think now, like my wife is a clinical psychologist and she works with kids with autism and Asperger's and she's been doing it nearly more than half her life. Uh, she's an expert in the field and I've been close to it since then. And then I re- when you think back, you think, my God, you know, there were certain students who back in the 80s, when I was in primary school, who definitely had autism or were on the spectrum, and we had no idea. We just thought they were weird and eccentric, um, you know. So you came across those people, and you came across people that came from some of the suburbs that are doing a lot better now, I guess, on the Eastern Shore, who you know who were from a lower socioeconomic background, and they you know they had their sort of third generation brothers hand me down. You know, we used to wear brown windshields in, in Gilston Bay High, and you know, so that opened you, and you learned an appreciation to appreciate you know who you were and what you had. Being in a, in a public school education 
scenario like that allowed you to relate to everyone on a whole on a whole different level because you could see where everyone was coming from. But at the same time, but at school in a classroom, we're all you know we're all there to learn the same thing, regardless of what we sort of necessarily go home to and stuff. So it was a good eye opener, and I think it it, it instilled the my compassion for community because I've grown into doing a lot of community work for years and years now you know I got nominated for Tasmanian of the Year and became was a finalist in 2015-16 and I just don't think about that you know I, I help I do a lot of community stuff and I think that comes from you know being in a in a situation back in school all my life in primary and, and in high school and even college where I dealt with all sorts of people from all sorts of different backgrounds and ethnicities and socioeconomic situations. And you learn to appreciate that and realise that, you know, we're all the same. You know, we're all, once we're at, we're at school, we're all there to learn, we're all there to become better people no matter what our background. And does that set you up well in life? So Absolutely. an understanding of different people from different backgrounds, Absolutely. how to interact, relate. It's not totally, horses for courses. Totally. I used to go, I used to, I, I was, did a lot of corporate entertainment coming into the late sort of 90s um, and I do a lot of gigs with my friend and we'd go out to bars and nightclubs after the gig we'd finish a corporate thing at the casino and we'd go out and and people would come up to me and say because they sort of knew who we were we were all quite prominent and we're in the paper or we we're on telly and ads and stuff so people would come and talk to us and some of them were quite scary looking tattooed sort of people and my friend who sort of I mean, he's a, he went to a similar sort of background, but he, he certainly had trouble, you know, and felt threatened every time these people came. And, I, and he, we'd sort of, I'd chat to them and we'd laugh and muck around. And then they'd leave and he'd say to me, Gee, I don't know, how, how, do you, how, like, how do you talk to these guys? How, like, how, how come you can communicate? And I said, I don't know. I, I guess I, I grew up and they're just people. They're just out having a good time, just like we are. The fact that, you know, we're in tuxedos, they're in a black T-shirt with tattoos up their arms doesn't make them necessarily any different. So... Yeah, like it's it's really helped me, and um, and I'm, I'm I'm grateful for it, and you know, I'm, I'm constantly happy to wave the flag for it as well. Do you still see yourself as a learner? Oh, absolutely. One of the one of the things I talk about when I go back to schools and talk about things, and whether it's you know a simultaneous story time day and reading to primary kids, or whether it's going back to drama schools at college level, I explain that what I re- learned very quickly, especially after I left school, is that you never you never stop learning. From anyone, from anyone, and like, and one of the things that really brought it home to me recently is um, trying to homeschool my six-year-old who's in grade one. You know, how did that go? Oh, it was tough. My wife would after about the first week, my wife would ring every day from work and just check to see how I was, how I was going. Checking in on your, I wasn't caving very well, but I learned a heap. You know, Um, stuff that I thought I knew. As well, so it's extraordinary. She's only in grade one, so that they're teaching kids stuff in grade one in primary school. She goes to Montague Bay, but you know, I thought I knew, but I didn't. She knows things that I don't know. You know, it's extraordinary how how it's changed. And so you never stop learning, whether you learn from someone who's a professor at uni or someone, or someone who's you know a, a professional, or even if it's a kid, you know, a young child who's learned stuff at school. She knows things that I. I had no idea. Like I learned from her all the time. So you never stop learning, and you never will till the day you die. There's always something, no matter how much you think you know, there's always a lot you don't or someone who knows more than you do. One of the things that we're exploring through this podcast is the idea of what makes a quality teacher. Have you got a teacher that you feel was a particular influence on you or that oh, yeah. particularly encouraging? No, I have several um, throughout the throughout the year, through primary, through, through high school. I mean, I know... Uh, Mrs. Burgess, who taught me French and German, she was really good. She was really understanding with me again because I would, because I was so good at the practical stuff, you know, and just bludged on the on the written sort of work stuff, and you know, and therefore basically did enough to pass. But had my written work been done, and or you know, uh, remotely up to scratch, I'd have I'd have credited some of these classes. So like, look, she was really good. I loved uh, Mr. Minor, who was PE. He was a great people person. I mean, uh, teachers are, are extraordinary. Um, as the suits I've had in my life because, and then you, when you get to college you realise the college was the first time at Rosney College I realised that teachers were real people just like you and me and they made mistakes you know I went through primary school even high school because you never you never get to go in the staff room unless you get dragged in there by a teacher for some reason you never went and I just thought teachers were these you know amazing perfect people who you know were quite you know strict when they had to be in the class and stuff and then went into the staff room and in the staff room because you get to Rosny and you're in the staff room all the flipping time then you realize these people are normal people like you you know and they just it, it, and it's their job but they bring 
what I loved about it, especially when I got to college, is they brought all this lovely, down-to-earth, relatable stuff with you. you know? Chris Thomas, my drama teacher, um, for most of my drama in Rosny College. Uh, Simon Hurst, who was my English lit teacher, but did a lot of sort of drama stuff. Those two were very influential in me choosing a, a career path. These teachers were very, very relatable and like always there to help you. And I sort of realised that a little bit. I got I realised it more in college, but it took me a while through primary and high school. When I go back and talk to these schools, that's what I talk about. I realised a little too late for myself that these the te- these amazing people that taught me in all my school career were there to help me and I I should have taken more attempts at asking them for help because that's what they're there for that's their job is to help you so you can constantly ask for help the whole time because that they because they want to help you they want to see you do well I realized after I'd left that you know all these teachers who I bump into at supermarkets and stuff and that's the beautiful thing about living in this state is you run into half your school life all the time and and how proud they are of, of what I've achieved and stuff. And you think, well, you really care. I wasn't just like a number or a, a snotty little bum on a seat. I was a real person that you cared about that you followed after I left. And you realised, you know, it, it makes you feel good to realise that you've made an influence. You've influenced uh, me. And they've, all, and they've certainly all done that. And I, I realised that all, all too late, unfortunately. But, yeah, it, it was great. I've, I would love to go back, now, knowing what I know now. Go back for year 14. <laughs> Yeah, I'd be awesome. <laughs> I would, I Studying would drama. Knock it out the park. I'd be on the cover of the paper when all the results come out with, you know, TCE, four, four teenagers and a 50-year-old going, hey, top, top the state in school marks. Have you got a favourite moment from school that, that comes to mind? Um, oh, yeah, look, if I really thought about it, there would be some, there'd be some awesome uh, moments. I can't really think about what they would be in primary school. No, yeah, well, there were just there were just like there were these moments in the playground, like there were like not like like sort of great education moments. Being a Greek kid, my mum used to give me a roll for lunch with feta cheese, olives, tomato, and spring onions in it. And, Bit smelly. Uh, yeah, yeah, and I remember one kid gave me so much abuse one day about that, just was picking on me flat out that I shook up my can of Coke and opened it in his face, and then instantly felt. Terrible, terribly guilty because I'd covered this kid in coke and ended up giving him half my salad roll, which he really loved. And since then, um, I had to get his mum to emulate uh, my lunches in, in primary school. Like, I do remember that. But my most moment to, to cut to the chase, I think Rosny College was when I first realised that I had an ability to stand in front of an audience and entertain. Was uh, every Friday we used to, theatre sports was very popular in, in schools in the late 80s. And I literally went from playing theatre sports to every every Friday, practically the entire school at Rosney would give up their lunch hour to come and watch theatre sports for the whole lunch hour in this room. And you'd be pushing it uphill now to, to get them to come and sit, give up their lunch hour and sit in an auditorium watching you play theatre sports nowadays. But back then, and then I've turned into emceeing the whole thing. So I would literally run the whole thing and I would stand up. And having a, a massive auditorium at Rosny who had the downstairs area and the two lecture theatres packed with people falling off the rafters, screaming and laughing. And, and, you know, I was throwing out lollies to them and they were throwing back one and two cent coins to me. There was this moment there when I thought, oh, this, it doesn't get any better than this. One of the other aspects that we're exploring is um, living in Tasmania and part of this podcast is also just to promote not only the great work of of public education but what a great place Tasmania is to live. And you've worked Melbourne, Sydney and you've worked internationally but you've come back here. Oh, always, always. I don't know, I guess it's because I probably left a bit older than I did. A lot of people now who, who do especially what I do in my field, but I guess in other fields as well, when they leave, they leave quite early. They'll finish uni and leave at like 21 or they'll get into drama school at 19 and go to Melbourne or Sydney and study for three years and then they're there. Uh, I guess I stuck to my guns and wanted to see as, get as much experience and learning as I could here and then didn't go to uni. Didn't, there was no real course for drama at Taz Uni. I wasn't going to go and live in Launceston for some reason. I wasn't, wasn't interested. There was a, I think there was a, a course there. So I, I started working on the mainland, other than the odd conference here or there, um, quite late. Like I was like 35 by the time I started working in professional musical theatre and spending heaps of time away 
on the mainland and overseas. So I guess I was, I was, I was established. And like I realised living in those places, and you don't realise until you live there, what we have here. It's that, whole, it's that the same old thing that everyone says, you know, realise what you've got until you haven't got it anymore. You know, and coming back here, I would, you know, on weekends or every sort of third weekend, you'd realise how great this place is and how... And there's a lot of aspects. So everyone's, everyone's different as, as to what they like. But um, for me, it was always just the, the quietness, the peacefulness of the place, the air, just the fresh air, just that cold breeze that hits you at the top of the steps when you step off that plane. And the fact that, you know, you have quiet times in the middle of the city. Melbourne on a Tuesday... It's like New Year's Eve at the docks in Hobart. Like, you know, th- that was extraordinary. You couldn't, you can't breathe. The, the rest of the, some of these big cities almost suffocate you. And we used to take that for granted here because we just think that's, that's just, you know, life's like this everywhere. But, but it's not, you know. And then, of course, since then, you realise you get older and you start exploring the state. I was very fortunate enough to work with the tourism department and went around the state for three weeks doing stuff and realised how amazing this state is and came back to my wife and said, we're not going to Sydney or Melbourne or Queensland ever again for a holiday. We're gonna we're gonna stay here. And and at the end of the day it's the people. Like even people come from the mainland and go, Oh, you're all so friendly down here. It's like, well, we are and we aren't. I could find you a whole bunch of non friendly people, but apparently we are. They don't get that over there. People, you know, you walk down the street here and I say hi and smile to every practically every stranger that looks at me. You know, you do that in Melbourne and they'll ask you what you're after and what you want and the next thing you know, you're in a scuffle, you know. it's We're a different breed down here and I think... And that feeds through everything. Feeds through, you know, our education, um, you know, our businesses, everything we do, you know. And I, and I love that. I feel safe. I feel at home. And if I can do what I can do at home, I just go and visit these other places and then say, bye, I'm going back to paradise, see ya. Um, yep, that's for me. As Tasmanians, we're very proud of you and your career, amazing career achievements. But what's the high? What's your highlight? Your career highlight? Ah, oh, gee, I have many. I mean, you can, I can always say apart you know, from this podcast. Yeah, well, this has now tipped the iceberg. Um, well, you know, it depends what you call a, a career highlight. I mean, I, I've I've been fortunate enough to work with some very big names. Um, your Todd McKenney's, your Kate Sobranos, your Lisa McCunes over the years. I've had the chance because of those shows of meeting um you know and spending time with people like Hugh Jackman with people like um uh Celine Dion would be like all these people that you you meet because you know you're in a capital city called Sydney and when those people are doing concerts or whatever they'll come and see your show you know Hugh Jackman's seen me in two shows now he's seen me do Lion King and he saw me do South Pacific so you're basically basically besties well sort of you know and then he came he came backstage in South Pacific and the opera house I don't know if you know the opera house is a massive green room that connects all the areas and we spent hour and a half in the green room after the show just chatting to Hugh Jackman like I'm chatting to you you know so those those highlights like that I think my first ever big commercial musical when I did The Lion King uh took over for it in Sydney as Pumbaa and then I did it in Melbourne and then we got bussed up the road to the um the Sofitel where we had the entire double story mezzanine and four everything booked out and there were 1500 people and every Australian celebrity you can think of was there and we got to walk in off the bus while they were all there and everyone cheered and clapped. And you got to approach people that you wouldn't normally approach, but because they'd come to see you and you had something to talk about. I think that was realising that I'd sort of gotten to where I wanted to get to. And it was pretty cl- touch, t- touch and go. I decided if I was, if I didn't hit the mainland by the time I was 35, I was going to pull the plug on thing and just, and just, do, just work in Tassie. Just get work here. And then literally two months before my 35th birthday is when the call came through from my agent to say, Lion King wants you to play Pumba. And and then my world just changed. So being there in that and having press and I think the, the Mercury flew over a journo who interviewed me on the night and stuff and they had a big sort of double page spread in the paper. Like, at that point I thought, okay, this is, this is pretty cool. But, you know, lots of things are highlights. I do gigs in halls, you know, at Claremont or in... Bernie or whatever, you know, 250 people and we do some old gags that we did in the uni review, you know, to real sort of grassroots, non-theatre going people and whether it's for a fundraiser or whatever and having them scream the roof off for doing, you know, and laughing there, making people laugh is pretty much the highlight for me and that's what I've always been comfortable with and always been easy doing um, and so that that's, entertaining an audience is pretty much the pinnacle for me and I'll, I'll die a happy man if I could just keep doing that of course now I have kids so you know I have to have some other priorities but um 
yeah, that, that for me, I mean, hitting the big time and knowing that I could do it and then getting into Billy Elliot straight away and realising the first time wasn't a fluke, uh, that was pretty satisfying. But there, there have been some great moments, but um, nothing beats being back here and performing to your home crowd, you know. We, we broke the record with We Will Rock You a few years ago at the, at the Theatre Royal and we didn't realise it was going to be that popular show. And that, was, that, that gave me the greatest joy because we had people coming into that theatre going, is this the Theatre Royal? Is this where you see... They'd never been there before. That's the, the Moments like that are, are, are the highlight for me, I think. So you've talked about uh, being at school. I think you have had some reflections around <laughs> things that you might have done differently and obviously some reflections about things that you'd like to do again with your, with your Year 14 enrolment. <laughs> if you could tell your younger self one thing, what would it be? Uh, it would be... oh. Just the one thing, never give up on your dreams because the people on your way up are, uh, the, who teach you, who guide you, who are mentors for you all want to help you achieve that dream. And, you know, nine times out of ten, you'll get it, I think. But, you know, the people along the way are there to help you get to it. They're not, no one's going to try and stifle your dream. So, um, you know, the, your people like your teachers and stuff, listen to them. I just need to listen to them a little bit more. Who knows, I might be on the space station by now, but it's nothing I really wanted to do, to be honest. So I'm, I got to where I wanted to be, and, and that's pretty cool. And I'm grateful to the people who helped me get there, and you know, most of that was were my teachers throughout school. Well, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you, John X. Uh, thank you thanks, so much for thanks. your time. Sorry, I've talked a lot, but yeah, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. I hope that you've enjoyed today's podcast. To hear more about those people who teach, learn and live in Tasmania, join us at www.education.tas.gov.au forward slash podcast or wherever you listen to your podcasts. Why not subscribe so that you can keep up to date with what we're doing? Or if you have a story about an inspiring teacher or student, email us at teachlearnlive at education.tas.gov.au.